I'm Kathleen. Most of you look familiar. We're going to spend an hour or so together just kind of going over the library resources. Um, basically, this is called an information literacy session. So we learn a little bit about the skills and resources to help you kind of navigate around the information world. So we'll kind of just together go through some of the concepts. Information literacy. You've been familiar with basic literacy to read and write and comprehend. Then we took it to computer literacy, learning different applications. And now what we want you to start thinking about is information literacy. There's so much information out there. How do I navigate around it? How do I find the good stuff? How do I evaluate it? How do I find what's relevant to my information need? So, can anybody read the definition of information literacy? Can you read it up here? So we have here, information literacy is a set of abilities, which are these sets here, requiring individuals to A, recognize when information is needed, and then to be able to locate the information. Once you've located all the information on your research need, what are you gonna do with it all? You're gonna use everything you found? I'm sorry? Go through it. You're going to go through it. And while you're going through it, what are you doing? You're going to evaluate it. Okay. Just because we found a lot of stuff on our topic doesn't mean that it's going to be good, right? It might be old information, outdated information. It might be somebody's personal opinions and maybe not necessarily fact. So we need to stop for a minute and evaluate all the information that we've gathered. And then we'll depend on how we use it. Are we going to do a 10-page research paper? Are we going to do um, this latest assignment, which is your critical analysis paper? Um, are you going to do a PowerPoint presentation? So all of that ties into how much information you gather, what types of information you gather, um, depending on how you're going to use it. Okay, so that's what information literacy is all about. So now we can go home, right? Okay, so one of the first questions on the quiz or actually, I think it's the last question on the quiz, is when you go to our UNM Taos Library, everybody knows where the library is, right? Right next door, Pueblo Hall East. When you go into the library, um, those of you who have started to think about your topic for this assignment, how do you know in what order the materials are in? Dewey Decimal, Library of Congress, good. Okay, these are good educated guesses. So at the UNM Taos Library and at any college or university library, the materials are going to be ordered by Library of Congress. And these are subject headings. Dewey Decimal is a very good answer because um, that's what we use in school, K through 12, and what we use in the public libraries. But just so you're aware, when you go to a college or university library, that the materials are going to be arranged by these subject headings. Okay? I don't expect you to go home tonight and memorize all these subject headings, but just so you kind of get a sense of how it works, what order they're in. It feels like it's alphabetical. Um, because when you kind of go to the library and you look at the shelves, you'll see it starts with A. It is alphabetical, but it's alphabetical by the subject headings. Not necessarily alphabetical by the author's last name or alphabetical by the classes. It's alphabetical by these subjects. And this is a very broad breakdown of the subjects. Again, I'll keep going back to the fact that it's really important for you to stop for a minute and figure out what is my information need? What is the thesis of my paper? And that way you can figure out what area you might be going to or what terms you might be using when you're searching electronically. So you can start in a general area and then kind of work your way into exactly what it is you're looking for. So if I was looking for legal books, where would I go? Looking at the sheet in front of you or the screen. In the K section for legal books. So I'm not necessarily going to want to look at all the legal books. I don't want to sit there and look through every K. So now it's time for me to figure out, okay, I'm looking for United States law. So United States law is KF. So I narrow it down a little bit. And within United States law, I'm looking for New Mexico law. So then I'd go to KFN. 
Within New Mexico law, I'm looking for family law. Within family law, I'm looking for child support law. So try to really focus in on what is your information need, what exactly is it that you're looking for. And that way you can get to the right area in the library, or you can use the right terms when you're searching online. Okay? There's something to think about. Again, any college or university, so depending on where you might go on your path from here, if you go to Adams State in Colorado, if you go to Harvard University, the materials are going to be arranged in the same order. So when you move on to another college, you'll be more familiar with how it works. And then on the back of the sheet, it tells you how to find a particular item. So in a minute, we'll go online, we'll do some searches, and you'll say, oh, there's a really good book. And you look and you find the call number or the address to get exactly to that book on the shelf. So that's how we're able to find materials. Just a little refresher. I know most of you have been through this before. Um, but it doesn't hurt to kind of be reminded of how this works. Library of Congress subject headings. So for this assignment, I was working as if I was one of Laura's students. And so for this assignment, I was thinking, so part of your assignment is it has something to do with an issue or a person that has had an impact. Is that correct? Something along those lines? Something that's been beneficial or impacted us in some way or another. So what I was thinking is, I believe that acequias have had an impact on, especially us here in northern New Mexico, how we use them, where they came from. So I thought, I'm going to do some research on acequias. So if I were to be looking at these Library of Congress subject headings, where would I start looking in the library? What subject areas would I find materials on acequias? S for agriculture, because we use it for irrigation for our crops and our orchards. And good. Do you think there'd be any any books on acequias in any other areas in the library, using these subject headings? History. History. Good. So again, this goes back to just because I I want to do a paper on acequias for this class doesn't mean that I'm going to write a whole paper about everything that has to do with acequias. I want to kind of stop for a minute and go, what am I really looking for? I mean, could you imagine if I put that in Google? I'd be looking at all these different results trying to figure out which one to use. So first answer was a very good one. In agriculture, I found books in the library, Spanish <coughs> irrigation in Taos Valley, right here, right about our area, how we use acequias, the mother ditch, Oliva Lafarge, so again, this is a book about um, using uh, the technical use of um, acequias in the agricultural section. I also found materials in the tea section. What's tea? Okay. So again, I don't know how many of you are familiar with acequias and how it works and having to open the head gates and when it goes to where and there's a whole science behind it. It's a very technical operation. So in the technology section, there are actually books on acequias and irrigation ditches. This one's, I don't know if any of you have heard of Stanley Crawford. Um, this is a book called Meyer Domo, The Chronicle of an Acequia in Northern New Mexico. So this again is chronicling a whole year of how you operate, when you clean them, etc. The workings of an acequia. Also in the technology section, Juan um, Ariano, Esteban Juan Ariano, unfortunately he's no longer with us, but he uh, researched a great deal about water in northern New Mexico. Enduring, enduring Acequias, Wisdom of the Land, Knowledge of the Water. This is in the technology section. So, so far I went to two different places in the library to figure out what I might use for my paper on Acequias. I found something in the G section. What's G? Okay. So again, think about whatever it is that you might be considering writing about. Does it have something to do with a particular area, um, particular culture, that sort of thing? Um, Sylvia Rodriguez, again, she's a Tausenia. Um, Acequia, water sharing, sanctity, and place. So this is in the geography section. It has to do with our particular area, our place. And someone mentioned history. That certainly would be uh, something to consider. Um, I also found materials in the H section. 
What's H? Okay. So when you're thinking about whatever it is your topic is, um, you may be thinking about how has it impacted, how has it benefited our culture, our society. And so in the H section is social sciences. Again, talks a little bit about what's going on in our uh, world, in our uh, families, in our communities. So in the H section, I have Asekia culture. So we talked about how we use it for agriculture. We talked about the technical use. And now we're talking about the actual culture of Asekias, water, land, and community in the Southwest. Have you, any of you ever been involved with Asekias or cleaning Asekias or using Asekias? It's, it's a whole community thing, right? We have meetings about what's going to happen. Um, cleaning day, we bring in potluck and have lunches. Um, so it's a community effort. The other thing to keep in mind is, depending on what your topic is, is start thinking about different key words that you might be using. So I found this beautiful book called Water in New Mexico, and I thought, this is going to have a whole bunch of stuff on acequias. So I went to the table of contents and looked up acequias, and really what they have it under is community ditches. And so I had to go to a different section within the book. So there, it talks about acequias, but it's actually in a section of the book that's called community ditches. So another thing to think about is you know, when you're looking at where in the library you might go, um, think about different terms, different places, different keywords. Okay? Does that make sense? Kind of, sort of. I also found a video, so it's another thing to keep in mind that we do have uh, several DVDs in the library that are documentaries. They're nonfiction, it's something you can use for research. This is called Nuestras Asequias, something you could use for your research. So just kind of think outside the box, think about where you might find materials, and keep in mind that the order in which the books are in the library are in Library of Congress subjects. And then what was the next thing? We have an information need. We have a paper we have to write. We have a thesis we're, we're researching. We located the information. I got all these books, DVDs, journals. And what was the next step after that? So just because I have all this, does it mean I'm going to use it all? We're going to evaluate it. You have to go through it, read through it, right? Some of you mentioned that already. One of the things we want to look at is where did the source come from, right? We want to look and see who published it, who wrote it. Are they experts in that field? So this sheet is just kind of giving you some criteria to look at, some things to think about when you do have some sources of information. Again, this is another deal where I don't expect you to go home and memorize them. But just start thinking about whenever you pull up a website, whenever you have an article in your hand, stop for a minute and say, who wrote this? Who published it? Where did it come from? You know, I've even pulled up websites that look totally credible. They have a really, you know, official logo, looks like it may be even a government website. And then I start reading it, and there's misspellings in it, the grammar's wrong. So again, just like, you know, it says here at one point, look at the structure, look at the style. Um, take a minute and review it before you decide whether this is good information, whether or not you can use it or not. Okay? So the idea here is that we're suggesting that you try to use more scholarly sources whenever possible. And we suggest this not just for your classwork, but for any time you're pick, trying to find information. Okay? More scholarly sources whenever possible. And one of the things I suggest nowadays also is really try to get two or three different sources before you actually come up with a final summary, conclusion, or answer. Okay? Try to get two or three different sources at least that kind of um, corroborate what you're trying to say or what you're trying to find. So we have the criteria set up here for scholarly sources, and then we compare that to other types of sources like popular magazines, and on the bottom of the sheet are your trade magazines. 
So we have different purposes for these sources, uh, different publishers for these sources. Again, just all we're suggesting is stop for a minute and kind of evaluate and review what you have before you start using it to make sure that it's factual, up-to-date, credible. What we're suggesting is that we try to use materials that were published by professional associations or academic institutions. Okay. Looking here again, who's publishing it, as opposed to maybe someone who's trying to make some money off of publishing that article. And it's selling lots of ads. What's, the, uh, what's in parentheses next to scholarly journal in that first column there? Anybody that I haven't heard from yet? What, what terms are in parentheses next to scholarly journal? <clears throat> Good, peer reviewed or refereed. So this is what we're suggesting, is that you try to use materials that have been reviewed by experts in the field before it was published. So keep that in mind. Scholarly journals go through this whole review process with peers or experts. I've been told it can take up to a year to get your article published in a scholarly journal because it goes through such a review process. That's the kind of information you want to try to use whenever you're doing research, writing a paper, etc. Peer-reviewed or refereed. What's the purpose of a scholarly journal article? In this first row here, the purpose of a scholarly journal article. Okay, good. So the operative word here is research. What we're suggesting in that is you only use materials that are based on research whenever possible. And how am I going to know something's based on research? What am I going to look for to see what kind of research they did? So when you write your papers, your teacher tells you that she wants to know all the uh, resources that you used, right? Where they got their information from. Where they got the information from. So if it's based on research, you're going to find a list of references or a works cited page. So if you find a website or you're using an article that doesn't have a list of references, try to just use that for background information and try to use more scholarly sources where they show you all the homework they did, all the research that they did in order to write that article. Okay? That's all we're suggesting is just take a moment, review the source, where did it come from, who published it, does it look like it's written properly, what's the date, where's the author from, Okay, just pay attention. And again, I wish I could give you another handout that says, here's a list of all the scholarly journal titles. You just need to look at this list and make sure that it's on that list. But I certainly couldn't do that. So anything that starts with the journal of, so if it, it, it's the journal of alcohol and drug education, the journal of research and childhood education, Journal of Religious Studies, Journal of Sports Medicine, whatever it is you might find, then you know that's a scholarly source. That's something that I can use for this assignment. Okay. Alternative Therapies in Health and Medicine. Is this a scholarly, peer-reviewed, refereed source? Is there any way of knowing? It doesn't say Journal of. Anybody have any thoughts about how we would know if this is scholarly? So one of the first things, as you mentioned, one of the first things we're going to look for is what? References. We're going to look to see if they did any research. So the first thing I want to look and see is all the references at the end of the article. So here's list all the research that they did in order to write that article. This actually has 56 references for a four-page article. So that's how in-depth these articles are. This is a kind of scholarly source peer-reviewed source we're looking at. And this particular one actually says a peer-reviewed journal right underneath it. You can't see it back there, but just keep in mind, oftentimes it's going to be right there. And I'll tell you, this is a peer-reviewed, refereed, scholarly source. And then this one here, American Sociological Review. I want to make sure that this is scholarly. Um, so again, I have to kind of figure out what is the criteria that I'm looking at. 
How do I find out? It doesn't say Journal of American Sociological Review. It doesn't say I'm peer reviewed underneath it. Um, again, we can look for the references in here. The other thing here is at the bottom of the cover, it says a Journal of the American Sociological Association. So this is telling you it's published by a professional association. So again, just kind of look around for a minute whenever you're gathering information and kind of determine where did it come from, who published it, who wrote it. <coughs> and then this one here, is this scholarly peer-reviewed refereed based on research? What do you think? No? This is more to inform, persuade, or entertain us. Time Magazine, US News and World Report, Psychology Today, most of the stuff that you see at Walmart or Smith's, um, these are popular magazines. You'll never see a list of references at the end of an article. Um, it's just kind of, it's a weekly, it's like getting it out, get some information out to you. Um, again, this is informing us about something that's happening. Maybe it's a weather event that happened, maybe it's an issue that's going on. Hate in America, it's the whole issue is about. This is something that's going on in our country right now, something to think about. Um, what do they mean by hate in America? So what you want to do is kind of read this article, get an idea of what is this issue, what is this topic, and then find some more scholarly sources that talk about the research that was done to show us what is going on in our society with hate in America. And is it racism? Is it genderism? Is it ageism? Um, what kind of hate? You know, so again, take it to the next step. There's nothing wrong with being informed about something in a popular magazine, but try to use more scholarly sources whenever possible. So that's a popular magazine, scholarly journals, popular magazines, and then if at the bottom of your sheet, you'll see the third type of periodical, and then we have trade magazines. Scholarly journals, popular magazines, trade magazines. And this is a way to kind of evaluate your sources, figuring out what is the source, where did it come from. So we have Lapidary Journal for the Jewelry Trade, something we subscribe to at the College Library. We have Wired for the Computer and Technology Trade. Anybody familiar with Wired? Kind of really keeps up to date on all the different technology and devices and all kinds of technical aspects of what we're doing. So again, I'm just trying to show you that you can come up with some topics, some ideas from other sources, and then try to do your research in a more scholarly source um, whenever possible. Okay, so those are just some ways for you to stop for a minute, kind of think about, is this good information? What's it based on? Where did it come from? Just, and again, whether you're on a website, whether you're in a research database, or whether you just pull something off the shelves at the library, um, it's more, I can guarantee you now, I've been in this business over 30 years, and it's more important now than it's ever been for you to put on your critical thinking cap and really try to evaluate the information that you're hearing or using, okay? Anybody hear of fake news lately? Have you heard of that term, fake news? Have you heard of the term alternative facts? Anybody hear of any of this stuff? How can, how can you have an alternative fact? Either it's a fact or it's not a fact, right? So these are kind of the concepts that we're hearing nowadays. So it's really important for you. And the only thing I suggest, like I said earlier, is when you do want to find an answer to something or you're doing research, be sure and get several sources that kind of come together and say the same thing or verify what it is you're trying to say. Okay? And so, does anybody remember the, the big P word that we want to avoid when we're writing a paper? Yep. It's really important that we give credit to wherever we get the information from. You know, there's nothing wrong with actually taking an exact quote, putting it in quotation marks, and putting it in our paper. But again, just be sure and let the reader know that you've got that from somewhere else. I know it's a gray area. It's something that we could spend a whole class talking about. 
Um, you've heard about it in bits and pieces over the years from various different professors. My motto is about three quarters of the way down. It says, when in doubt, cite it. And, and it's, it's actually threefold. There are three reasons or more why we do this. It's like a holistic approach here. It's not just because, oh, my teacher told me I have to write down where I got all this from. It's kind of the, the first one, like I said, is giving credit to where you got the information from. And my hope and dream is that someday someone's going to be citing you. And so think about that. You know, you want to give credit to who did that work. Someday you might get so passionate about something that you'll put up a website or you'll write an article. Um, and so you'll want people to, to write in their paper that they got it from you. So you're giving credit to where you got it from. The other piece is for the reader. So if I read Rocky's paper and I go, how in the heck did he come to that conclusion? That's really interesting. I can go ahead and I can look at his sources. I can look at the, the website he went to or the article that he read, and then maybe I can learn more or I might even change my mind by figuring out how he got to that point. So it's for the reader as well. Do you ever kind of think about what the third reason is why we have references? And this is for you at this point. So you're at the research stage, right? You have to write a paper, you're coming up with a topic or an issue or a person. And so when you start doing your research and you find a website or you find an article and you go, yeah, this is really good, look at the references that they provided and that can be a path for you to find more information. So when you find a good book or a good article, look at the references and maybe you'll find a couple more to lead you down to more information for your paper. So it's also kind of breadcrumbs to show you more information as well. Okay? So yes, we want to avoid plagiarizing. I'm sure you all know there's several different styles of citing your sources depending on what discipline you're in. But mainly here at UNM Taos, you know what styles we use? Somebody want to tell me what styles we use here? What's that? MLA APA. MLA and APA? Good. Okay. So again, there are many different styles depending on what discipline you're in, but primarily the basic ones we use here at UNM Taos is MLA, which you're using for this class, Modern Language Association, and that's for your humanities, religion, literature, that sort of thing. And then APA is American Psychological Association, and that's your hard sciences as well as your social sciences. So it's psychology as well as biology. So APA, those are the two styles. And then on the back of the sheet, does anybody want to read out loud the philosophy here behind avoiding plagiarism? Yes, sir. Um, students need to understand that by plagiarizing the words of others, they are not allowing their own academic voice to grow and be heard. Consequently, students are damaging their potential as human beings. Good. So again, this is just something to think about. Yes, the teacher said you had to cite your sources, but really, when you're given an assignment, a written assignment, a research assignment, stop for a minute and try to do something that's relevant to you. Something that you already know a little bit about, something that you want to learn more about, something that will help your family or your church or your community. Okay, so don't just grab something because we saw it in Time Magazine and go, I'm going to write a paper on this. Start from your voice first. What is it that you already know about this? What is your personal experiences? Share your, your traditions, your culture, um, your political views, your religious views. This is the time to do that when you're in academia. Okay, start kind of reaching out, searching, blossoming. Um, this is the time. And then you're going to go ahead and kind of sprinkle in the research and the facts and the data and the statistics that have to do with whatever it is you're researching. Okay, so come from your voice. That's what this is about. So in this class, do you share with each other? Um, do you either read out loud your topics or you do peer reviews or stuff like that? So that's what this is about. I mean, this is your voice and we get to learn from each other. I mean, that's, that's what, so that's all I'm suggesting is, again, Avoid plagiarism by going ahead and letting the reader know where you got the information, but basically it should come from you and your experiences. 
Does anybody remember my, my KWL model? So I'm given this assignment, and I, I have this assignment here. And basically, even Laura talks a little bit about coming from your own experiences in the assignment itself. Um, so I'm given this assignment, and then I have to sit here and start figuring out, OK, how am I going to get started on this? What am I going to write about? Um, how do I get started? So personally, I usually start with an outline, kind of thinking about, OK. So if I decided that I'm going to do this paper on a sec, yes, since I was already <coughs> started researching it, the first thing in the outline is, what do I already know about Asekias? So that's going to be your outline. Those of you, again, who have, have already started coming up with this, an issue or a person or whatever it is that you're doing this assignment on, start writing down. What do I know about this topic or this person? What's my personal experiences? What's my personal knowledge? Have I ever done this before? Okay, so you start writing down what you know about this topic or this person. What would this be then? This is what I know. Now what? This is the research part. This is what do I still need to know? What do I still need to learn? So now I start figuring out what is it that I re need to research? I mean, I might know how to clean an acequia because I've done it before. I might know um, when they open the head, head gates. I might know um, what the formula is on um, you get it at 3 o'clock on Fridays and you get it at 2 o'clock on Mondays. There's a formula of, of how we distribute it. But maybe I don't know the history of Asekias. You know, did it really come over here from the Moors? I mean, so now, now maybe I need to really do some research. So this is where I need to start figuring out what is it that I need to research. I think for this assignment, part of what you're researching is what are the benefits? What was the impact of this issue or this person or this topic? So this is what you're going to be researching. And then what would the L be? What did I learn? So this is the conclusion. This is your conclusion, your summary. This is what you want the reader to finish reading your paper and now know or understand. KWL. And I'm sure over the years, um, all the assignments you have had to write, you have your own way of dealing with this besides procrastinating to the night before. Um, but you have different ways of dealing with your assignments. But this is just one simple one that I use to kind of get started. So I don't know if that's helpful or not. So we have an information need. We have a thesis for our paper. We have a topic. We're trying to find, relocate the information. We talked a little bit about evaluating the information, where the source came from. And then the next piece is um, how we're going to use it. So let's go ahead and get on our computers now. And those of you who have your computer already up and running, we're going to go to the library website. And we do that by going to towns.unm.edu slash library. And my hope and dream is that you're going to go home and actually set this up on your own computers as well. Uh, give you another sheet before you leave. Somehow you made it to the main campus's library, which is okay, but we're going to follow the UNM Taos library today. So again, just want to kind of familiarize yourself with the website. Some of this stuff that's available 24-7. It's got our hours up here. We're open until 7 o'clock at night, most nights. Our phone number, again, I talked a little bit about our human resources a minute ago. There's my full name and my email if you need to ever contact with me. Um, Dave is the assistant librarian. Justin is our techie librarian. So again, don't hesitate to email us if you have any questions, if you're at home and you can't get into a database or something like that. If you scroll up a little bit in the middle of the page, you'll see some of the services we provide. 
interlibrary loan. Is anybody familiar with interlibrary loan? So this is a service where anytime there's anything that you want that's not here at UNM Taos, you go ahead and let us know. What I do is I go out and I find every library in the world that owns whatever it is you need, and I ask them to send it here for you. And it doesn't have to be for school, so keep that in mind. If there's a book, a DVD, a government document, a musical score, anything that you want, um, please don't hesitate to fill out a form here. Um, it'll just ask you for basic information. You hit submit. It goes directly to the library and we go out and find the libraries that own it and have them send it here for you. It takes about a week for the item to get here, depending on where it's coming from. So just kind of keep that in mind so you manage your time a little bit. Request for information. I don't know if any of you have ever used the request for information, but again, don't stress out. If you're having a hard time finding an answer or getting a phone number or whatever it might be, fill out a request for information. My staff and I put our heads together we either get you the answer that you need, or we find specific databases or websites that will help you with your research. So again, don't ever hesitate to use requests for information. It just asks you a couple questions. You hit the submit button, it'll go right to the library. We don't necessarily do your homework for you, um, but we at least try to get you started uh, with what it is you're looking for. You scroll back up to the top, you'll see several Again, 24-7, all of these links, all of these resources, all of these tools are available to you. So again, you know, don't stress out. Look around on the website, see if there's anything that could be helpful to you. Things like virtual reference shelf will be your uh, online dictionary, online encyclopedia, that sort of thing to get you started. Um, some of you may already be familiar with the writing toolbox. But this is, again, something that could be helpful to you. We talked a minute ago about citing your sources. And it also shows you how to cite your sources. So if you're sitting at home and you're not sure how to cite a website in MLA, this is kind of a quick reference sheet that's at your fingertips 24-7. So there's no excuses, folks. Everything's right here. Just need to kind of look around and use the tools that are available to you. You've probably talked a little bit about OWL in this class already. Are you familiar with the online writing lab? So right here, there's a link to the online writing lab. It's uh, produced by Purdue University. And this is another tool that can be helpful to you. It's kind of a 24-7 tutoring center. Um, so it's something, you know, if you get your paper back and the teacher says you, you're not using your commas correctly or something, you can go online here and it'll show you a little bit about how to use them. What I do when I go to Purdue, to, to OWL, is the first thing I do is I hit general writing. And that'll take me in to some of the sources that I can use. And then from here we have common writing assignments. So this is where I was talking about if you get your paper back and you need to work on some of the grammar or punctuation, um, if you can't get into CASA or to a tutor, you can always look here online and get some tutoring that way. From here, I hit common writing assignments, and this is where, you know, maybe you're, you're told you have to do an argumentative essay and you're too embarrassed in class to ask what the heck is an argumentative essay, and so you can come into OWL and you can learn all about how to write an argumentative essay. For this class, there isn't really anything in particular that matches this assignment, but I did look at um, book review, and it kind of helped along the lines of some of the stuff you'd be looking for. When you look at book review, it talks a little bit about the genre that you might be writing about, some of the characters and themes, um, what's your argument, Again, if you're saying that whatever it is you're writing about was beneficial or had an impact, this talks a little bit about how you address your argument. So looking at some of the online tools can be helpful to you. just want to make sure you're aware of online writing lab. Do you use Blackboard Learn for this class? Does the teacher have anything on, uh, on, on online for you to use? Okay. So this is something you might want to look at that's directly linked from the library website. 
All you need to do is go into Writing Toolbox. Again, it will show you how you cite your sources, and it will help you how, in how you write your paper using the Writing Toolbox. From here, if any of you have been following along and you've made it into this page, we want to go back to the home page, and you do that by clicking on UNM Taos Library to get back to the home page. So we have all these tools and resources on the left-hand side. What we're going to look at right now are the online catalog, so we can find out what's actually in the libraries that might help us, and the research databases, so we can find articles that might uh, help us answer our question or write our paper. So I talked a little bit about doing research on water in New Mexico, about acequias. So I want to go to the online catalog. So right up here where it says start here. This is where you start your search in the catalog. And I'm going to type in water. I want to see what's in the libraries, on the shelves, that has to do with water. And if you want to do the search along with me to see how it works, you're welcome to. Um, so what we have here is we've just done a search in the online catalog, trying to find out what materials are in the libraries on water. Does anybody want to tell me how many results we came up with? How many items are in the libraries on water? 7,883,000. So that's pretty good, huh? That should keep me busy for a few nights, looking through to see if there's anything there. So this all goes back to one of the first things I said an hour ago, and that is, what does my information need? What is the thesis of my paper? And so what you want to do when you're searching online, when you're searching electronically, is you want to stop for a minute and think about what are some key terms? What are some key words? I mean, I got seven million, almost eight million just in a library catalog. Could you imagine if I typed water into Google? Okay, again, billions of results. So I have to kind of stop for a minute and using these Boolean operators is something that's really going to help you kind of narrow down or focus in your results. Okay? There actually was a Dr. Boole. He was a physicist from London. These are called algorithms. And so when you use and and when you use not, it'll narrow down or focus in more relevant results, more results that you can use. <coughs> Using or will help kind of broaden it. So like I said, when I was looking up acequias, I came up with community ditches. So I could type in acequias or community ditches, and that would bring up more information. Okay? Using not would narrow it down. I could do acequias, not ditches. Okay? So using your Boolean operators, and this is anytime you're searching on a computer, anytime you're searching electronically, come up with a couple key terms and then narrow them down with your Boolean operators. So we've done our search, we're in the library catalog trying to find out what materials are available. We've come up with over 8 million, or almost, almost 8 million. So I want to use a Boolean operator to kind of narrow down. I don't want everything on water. I want materials on acequias. So actually in WorldCat, your Boolean operators need to be capitalized. I've been arguing with them to try to see if they can fix that, but I'm going to use my Boolean operator and, and I'm going to say acequia, water and acequia and see if I can narrow down the results that are in the library on my topic. I just went from almost 8 million to 381, just by using one Boolean operator and one clarifying term. So start thinking about this right now while we're in class. What is, <coughs> what is it that you're writing about for this next assignment? And how can you narrow it down a little bit? It's okay to start broad sometimes, but start thinking about, okay, how, where am I going with this topic? How can I narrow this down? OK. 
Okay. So I've gotten pretty um, well here narrowing it down. Anybody ever hear of truncation when you're searching online? So this is water and acequia. What about, am I going to find this in there now? This is called Nuestras Acequias. And so I want to make sure that I get everything that is Acequia and Acequias. So I can take that A and I can turn it into a star, which is a truncation. And I went from 381 to 587, because now I'm getting everything that has Acequia and Acequias. So it's another thing to kind of think about. Can you think of some other terms where you would do that? Like nursing, you could do N-U-R-S and the star, and then you'll get nurses, nursing, nurse. nurse. Um, so again, think about maybe the root of your word, and how can you find more materials that might be helpful to you when you're searching online. And then, I don't want to look at 587. One of the things I was talking about here, um, was it the technical aspects of Asakias? Was it the agricultural aspects? Um, but for this assignment, what I'm looking at is the cultural aspects. What is the impact of Asakias on our culture? So then I'm going to use my Boolean operator and, and I'm going to put in culture. So I went from almost 8 million results down to 149 items that are available through the libraries on my topic. So that's all I'm suggesting. Again, this is part of being information literate. There's so much information out there. Stop for a minute and figure out what is it that I'm looking for? How do I narrow it down? How do I tell the computer what I'm looking for? And it just so happens what we're looking in right now is the World Cat online catalog telling you what's in the libraries. So this is a catalog where you find books, DVDs, etc. that are in the libraries. And you'll notice here, one of the first ones that come up are e-books. And that might be great. Maybe it's 11 o'clock at night, you're in Cuesta, you have one more source for your paper. You go, oh, I'm going to go on to World Cat. I'm going to find an e-book, and I'm going to open up an electronic book and do the end of my homework using that book. Um, so people may like using e-books, it may be um, resourceful to use e-books, um, but personally I don't like e-books. So what you can do is come over here, after you've done your search, you've narrowed it down, now you can come here and you can tell the computer what exactly it is you want. I don't want e-books, I want print books. And so out of 149 materials in the libraries on my topic, there's really only 12 print books on the shelves in the libraries that I can use. So again, use your limiters, but then come over here and see how you can narrow it down to whatever it is that you want to use or will be helpful to you. The other thing to keep in mind is the publication date. If you're doing anything kind of medical, scientific, etc., you want to try to use materials that were written in the last five years. So anytime you're in a database or in an online catalog, see how you can narrow it down by publication year as well. If you do want to use an ebook, um, you can once you click on view ebook, you just put in your UNM net ID and password, and it'll get you right in. So you can be anywhere that you have the internet and you can put it in your UNM credentials and you can view that electronic book right there on the computer. And another tool I showed you a minute ago on the library website in the writing toolbox, the little cheat sheet on how you cite your sources, oftentimes you just need to look right there on the page. So if I decide I want to use this book for my paper, I just click on cite. I come here and I say, oh, for this class I use MLA, so I'm going to choose my style. And here's my citation right here. So again, this is when I open up my Word document. I go ahead and I copy this. I paste it right into my Word document and I have my bibliography and my works cited started. Okay, so you don't have to sit in, you don't have to remember where the parentheses goes and 
whether you put the, the author's first name or first initial or just take the citation right from the source itself. So in order to get back to the home page to look at the research databases, you can just click on the logo on the top left and it'll take you back to the home page. And from here, we want to look at the research databases. And this is where we're going to find articles. So once you click on research databases, you're going to get a whole other screen that gives you all these different access points to different databases that are available to you, depending on what type of research you're doing. ProQuest is good for reviews. So when you're doing your paper, if you want to find reviews on a film or um, on a book, um, it's a good place to go. InfoTrack and EBSCOhost, the two here, are, have the most varied databases as well as scholarly sources. So the InfoTrack and EBSCOhost are two places that, to get started on your research. I want to show just for this particular class, let's click on where it says EBSCOhost databases. So some of you are familiar, when we, usually when we get to this page, we'll go ahead and click on this top row, which shows us all the EBSCOhost databases that we can get into. And there's an alphabetical list of many databases. And again, this is where you stop for a minute and you go, what does my information need? I clicked in the box to the left of business source. So in order to choose all the ones that you want, all you do is click in the box to the left and keep going down to choose the ones that you want. If you click on the actual title of the database, it's just going to open up a search screen just for that database. So to choose a a number of them, I went down to the E's, and I always, oftentimes I'll use education research. Another kind of powerful database that covers a lot of areas. And because I'm doing alternative energy, obviously I'm going to choose this energy database and the environment database. And then I'm really kind of stretching it, but all the way at the bottom there's a wildlife and ecology one but I want to see how maybe alternative energy plays into some ecology. So once I choose all the ones that I want, I click on the continue button and I get my search screen. This is where, again, just take a moment before you start searching and make sure some of your limiters are set up. So when you do the search, you'll get materials that you can actually use. I've gone in the background here and I've set it up to where you'll just get full text. But sometimes you'll have to, if you're using different databases, you might start, stop for a, look, for a minute and make sure that you actually check off full text. That way you don't just get a citation and you have to ask the librarian to go get it for you. If you check off full text, then you'll get the whole article when you do your search. We talked earlier about all the criteria of what is a scholarly source, what is a peer-reviewed source. You don't always have to remember that. It's right here for you. So there's no excuses anymore, folks. Everything is right there at your fingertips. So if your professor does tell you you need to do this assignment and you need to use at least two scholarly sources or two peer-reviewed sources, if you click right here and you do your search, everything that comes up will be acceptable to that assignment will be scholarly, peer-reviewed, refereed. So use the limiters sometimes also. Okay, so this is your search screen for the research databases to get articles on your topic. And look here, Kathleen wasn't being so silly about using Boolean operators. They're actually built into the databases. That's how important they are. So right there, it's ready for you to kind of narrow down your search um, whenever you need to. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to search alternative energy. I'm going to write my paper in this class on alternative energy. So I want to see what full text articles are available on this topic. And again, you have your computers in front of you. You're welcome to start typing in your own topic and seeing what might be in there. But I came up with almost 47,000 full text articles right there at my fingertips. Come on, folks, you can't beat it. 24-7. Right there. All you got to do is email it to yourself, print it out. You've got all the information you need to either 
answer the question or write your paper? Well, I, again, I'm going to have to narrow this down. I'm not going to write my paper on alternative energy in, in general. There's a lot out there, and there's 47,000 articles. So this is where, again, part of the assignment is what is the impact of alternative energy? And so I wanted to write what's benefits of alternative energy. And one of the things you also want to look at on your screen is stop for a minute. I can type in benefits, or I can take a minute and look and go, oh, I can cover benefits or advantages or positive effects all at the same time. So as you're typing, look at the screen and see if there's anything else there that could be helpful to you. So I'm just going to go ahead and take the whole deal. <coughs> Alternative energy and benefits or advantages or positive effects. And I eliminated over 40,000 articles. Just kind of narrowing it down to what I need for this assignment of this class. And what I'm really interested in, I'm not interested in nuclear energy, I'm not in interested in wind turbines, because we're in the solar capital of the world, I want to see um, what there is about solar energy. So now I'm narrowing it down to full text articles on my topic. And I've pretty much given it what I want. If you want to add more, you can always put the plus and add some more terms to narrow it down some more. Or again, you can come over here and look at your limiters. So I've done the search that I want to do, and now maybe I can limit it a little bit more. Again, maybe I can say that I want stuff that was written in the last five years on solar energy. So I can move this over. So use your timelines, use the sources of information. So now I have 380 full text articles on my topic that can help me get started. A couple more things I just want to show you about EBSCO that you may already be familiar with, but I don't want to sit here and open up every article to see if it's going to be helpful to my paper. If you come over here to the magnifying glass, it'll tell you about that article. So instead of opening every article, I can click on the magnifying glass, read the summary, and then determine whether that's something that I want to use for my paper or not. If I want to use it, I can just click on PDF full text, and I have the whole article. If I decide I don't want to use it, I can just move down to the next one. And then lastly, just to show you, again, to use the tools that are available to you whenever possible. So I decide I'm going to use this article. Instead of sitting here trying to figure out how do I write the author and, and how do I set the journal name and what database I got it from, I can come here and it tells me exactly how to cite it. So right within the database, I can go ahead and I can find MLA. I can take this, copy it and paste it into my works cited or my bibliography. So the citation is right there for you. You can email the article to yourself and come into the library and print it out. You can save it on your flash drive. But again, the citation information is right there for you. So this is EBSCOhost. It's got several different research databases to help you with this assignment. But also, again, feel free to explore points of view which is another database that I think would be helpful to you for this class. What do you think, guys? Can the sort of might help? <laughs>